We'll read Psalm 92 now. Psalm 92. We consider Lord's Day 45 this morning and the subject of prayer. We consider the subject of prayer as the chief part of thankfulness. And we read Psalm 92 now as a prayer of thanksgiving to God. It is a good thing to give thanks unto the Lord and to sing praises unto Thy name, O Most High, to show forth Thy loving kindness in the morning and Thy faithfulness every night upon an instrument of ten strings and upon the psaltery, upon the harp with a solemn sound. For Thou, Lord, hast made me glad through Thy work. I will triumph in the works of Thy hands. O Lord, how great are Thy works, and Thy thoughts are very deep. A brutish man knoweth not, neither doth a fool understand this. When the wicked spring as the grass, and when all the workers of iniquity do flourish, it is that they shall be destroyed forever. But Thou, Lord, art most high forevermore. For lo, Thine enemies, O Lord, for lo, Thine enemies shall perish. All the workers of iniquity shall be scattered. But my horn shalt Thou exalt like the horn of an unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Mine eye also shall see my desire on mine enemies, and mine ears shall hear my desire of the wicked that rise up against me. The righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in Him. Thus far we read the Word of God this morning. It's on the basis of that passage and all of Scripture that we consider the four questions and answers this morning of Lord's Day 45 in the Heidelberg Catechism. Why is prayer necessary for Christians? Because it is the chief part of thankfulness which God requires of us, and also because God will give His grace and Holy Spirit to those only who with sincere desires continually ask them of Him and are thankful for them. What are the requisites of that prayer which is acceptable to God and which He will hear? First, that we from the heart pray to the one true God only, who hath manifested Himself in His word for all things He hath commanded us to ask of Him, Secondly, that we rightly and thoroughly know our need and misery, that so we may deeply humble ourselves in the presence of His divine majesty. Thirdly, that we be fully persuaded that He, notwithstanding that we are unworthy of it, will for the sake of Christ our Lord certainly hear our prayer as He has promised us in His word. What hath God commanded us to ask of Him? All things necessary for soul and body, which Christ our Lord has comprised in that prayer He Himself taught us. us. And what are the words of that prayer? Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. 
Beloved congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, having now finished our consideration of our calling to keep the law of God out of gratitude for salvation, we now turn to our calling to pray to God in order to show Him our thanks. Now ideally, there really is no distinction between a life of gratitude and obedience to the law of God and prayer. We are called to have God always in our minds and in our hearts. We are called to always think about God, to worship and to serve Him consciously in everything that we say and in everything that we do, seeking to obey Him and keep His commandments out of gratitude for our salvation. And if we live that way, then we are fulfilling the command that is placed upon us by the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 17, where he tells us to pray without ceasing. Really, that's the life of a Christian. It is a prayer of praise and gratitude to God in everything He says, in everything He does. A prayer of praise and gratitude without ceasing. But of course, we fall short of that. And because we do live in a world where we so quickly forget about God, where we so quickly set our minds and our hearts upon the things that are here below, we need set times of prayer. Times where we consciously turn our attention to God. Times where we consciously tell ourselves to set aside the things of this earth. Not only to set aside the things of this earth, but actually tell ourselves to leave the things of this earth behind and as it were, fly off to heaven itself, to the very throne room of God's grace, to spend some time conversing and dwelling with God. We need that. Oh, we need that because we soon forget. And it might be added, we need that as those who are so quickly consumed by this world and who so quickly forget about God and His law and His ways. But we might add to that this. If our Lord Jesus Christ, about whom you could say His life was, prayer of praise to God in obedience of prayer without ceasing. That was his life. If he saw the need, and if he took the time to set aside for prayer to God, how much more don't we need that? Thus, we need set aside times special moments of prayer, and we need this morning to consider the instruction of the Heidelberg Catechism, the instruction, therefore, also of Scripture concerning prayer. And there's many things, there are many things that could be said about our attitude towards this instruction in this Lord's Day and those that follow. But as we approach the catechism's instruction regarding prayer, let's remember especially these two things. Number one, that we ought to have teachable hearts. I don't think it would surprise you for me to say to you this morning that I am very often conscious of how inadequate and how insufficient my prayers are. My personal prayers, my prayers with my family at family devotions, my congregational prayers. And I don't think it would be 
out of order or an exaggeration for me to say that I know all of you, maybe often, at one time or another, feels how inadequate and insufficient your prayers are too. It's been my experience as a pastor that sometimes members of the congregation come to me with this concern and even office bearers. How can I grow in prayer? They come with that concern saying, my prayers aren't as meaningful as they ought to be. My prayers aren't as sincere as they ought to be. They seem so shallow. They seem so repetitive. They seem to be so inadequate. How can I grow in prayer? Because none of us, not even the holiest among us, has ever uttered a prayer that was perfect, using perfect wording. And because none of us, this is maybe even more important, has ever offered a prayer with a perfectly sincere heart, we, the children not only, but all of us ought to have the attitude, we need this instruction from our Reformed Creed and from the Word of God on how to pray. But then secondly, we need to have the attitude, the attitude of gratitude or thankfulness in our hearts. We need to be humble. We need to admit our weakness. It's maybe even appropriate from some point of view to be embarrassed by our prayers. But yet, we need to pray and we will pray because now, as when we consider the law of God, now as we consider prayer, we need to have chief in our minds God's grace in delivering us through the Lord Jesus Christ. So that we may hear God saying to us, I've forgiven you all your sins. And in that salvation from your sins, I've given you, and we ought to see it this way, beloved, a gift more precious than a diamond and more precious than a pearl. God says, I've given you the gift of prayer. Now come to me in prayer. And though we are sinners then, though even our prayers are marred by weakness and sin, we will pray because we have the right to pray as God's adopted sons and daughters. Thus our prayers must always be motivated by thanksgiving. We want to thank God for our salvation. And now the catechism says, recognize this. This is the way to thank God through prayer. And so let's consider this Lord's Day under that theme, showing gratitude by means of prayer. And in point number one, we're going to consider the nature of prayer. What is prayer? This is a basic primer, we might say, on prayer. And then secondly, we're going to consider the necessity of prayer as the catechism lays that before us this morning. And then finally, the model of prayer. Let's ask that question this morning. For the sake of our children who need to learn how to pray, what is prayer? But then also for my sake and for all of our sakes, let's be reminded this morning of what this very important activity in our lives is. What is prayer? And the Lord's Day answers that for us, especially in question and answer 117. In question and answer 116, the Lord's Day does give us some instruction from which we can glean things about what prayer is. But there the catechism and that first question and answer is telling us this is why prayer is so necessary and important. But then it's when we come to question and answer 117 that the catechism says now this is what prayer is. 
what are the requisites of that prayer which is acceptable to God and which he will hear. A requisite, children, is something that is necessary for achieving a goal. And the Catechism is going to tell us the things that are necessary for achieving this goal, for making a prayer that God will hear. And in that, then, the Catechism is saying, this is what prayer is is. And notice now this morning that the focus of the catechism is not so much to tell us what the content of prayer is, although that is explained briefly in this Lord's Day. That will be our focus in the coming Lord's Days as we consider the specific parts of the Lord's Prayer. But really what the catechism is doing here this morning is telling us this is what prayer is. And we can see immediately how important that is, can't we? The Catechism is saying this, if you don't know what prayer is, so that you don't pray in this way, you don't follow these requisites, then whatever prayer you make is going to fall from your lips and fall to the ground. It won't make it to heaven. God won't hear just any prayer, but he will hear this prayer. So what is prayer? And the first thing that we look at this morning when we answer that question is the direction of prayer. Well, this is very basic, isn't it? We know what the direction of prayer is. But how often do we fail to direct our prayers Properly. How often are we guilty of directing our prayers maybe to ourselves or to other people? The Catechism reminds us here this morning, and this is something that the children need to learn, that the direction of our prayers is up to God. That's implied, of course, in question and answer 116. God will give His grace and Holy Spirit only to those who with sincere desires continually ask them of Him. In prayer we go to Him, to God. Question and answer 117 states it this way. We pray from the heart to the one true God only who hath manifested Himself in His Word. We pray to the one only true God. But then the Catechism is making a very profound point when it adds who has manifested Himself in His Word. Ah, here we come to a very important point about what Prayer is. It is right for us to say that prayer is a conversation with God. Don't think of prayer as a one-way street. Don't think of prayer as you and me storming God in heaven with our needs and our requests. Don't think of prayer at all this way. That we go to God and then God responds to us. There is a sense in which it is right for us to say God does respond. He does answer our prayers. That's what the Bible teaches us. But don't have that conception this morning that prayer starts with man. That man governs and guides and directs prayer. The catechism says it's very important that you understand that prayer is a conversation with God that starts with God. God must manifest Himself first to us in His Word. God must first speak to you so that you will know who God is. 
so that you will know that He is the one only true God, so that you will form your prayers with that in mind. That you're not going to heaven to talk to someone who is equal with you on the same plane with you. And so that you won't be bold to go to God in prayers bringing whatever comes to your mind. No. You must remember that God speaks first. He is the Sovereign One. Worthy of reverence and honor and respect. We'll look at this in more detail in the next Lord's Day, but let's remember, we go in prayer as children to speak with our Father. Or as servants to speak to our King, who is first spoken to us. We go as creatures as human beings, to speak to the Creator who made us. And then this too, as sinners, to go to speak to the pure and holy God. So to pray, this is very practical, In order to pray, that implies the need to listen to God. You go to heaven and you haven't listened to God. You haven't meditated on His Word. God's going to say, how do you think you know who I am? You don't even know who I am. And who do you think you are? You're going to come to me with demands? Listen to me first. The Catechism says we need to know that to know who God is, but then also to know what God wants us to ask Him in prayer. Don't think of prayer this way. It's my opportunity to go to God and tell Him and ask Him for Anything under the sun. Anything that I think about and want and need. No. No, you go to God as your sovereign Lord and King. And then then this too is very practical. Sometimes, have you ever felt this way? People say, I'm running out of things to pray for. My prayers seem repetitive. I don't know what to pray. And then, when I felt that way, this is the answer that a wise man gave me. And this is the answer for you and me. Listen to God. Open up His Word. Hear what He has to say to you. And then you will find that you have something To say to Him. What a wonderful thing. That God speaks first. And tells us who He is. The sovereign God. The all-sufficient God. The all-powerful and the all-knowing God. He's not a God who does not have ears and cannot hear. He's not a God who has ears and cannot hear. He is the living God who hears prayer. He is the living God who is able to answer prayer. He's not a weak God to whom we bring requests thinking, I'm not sure if He can really help me. Because He tells us in His Word so many wonderful things about Himself. He tells us in His Word that He is everywhere present. That He is here and that He is there to hear. The Apostle Paul tells us in Acts 17, verse 27, He's not far away from every one of us, for in Him we live and move and have our being. 
And Psalm 139 says, you don't, have to, you don't have to think God is ever far away. He's never on a vacation or a journey. Like Elijah suggested Baal was, and we considered that a couple of weeks ago. The psalmist says, you can go up to the highest heaven and God is there. And you can even go down to hell and God is there. And even if you would cross the Atlantic Ocean, go to the farthest distant shore, God is there. And you can't hide from Him in the dark. God is there. And so yes, you don't need to go to the temple in Jerusalem. You don't need to come to this building anywhere. Anywhere that you fold your hands and close your eyes and direct your hearts to God, He's there to hear your prayer. And He's all-knowing too. You don't want to go to a God, an idol, or to a person who is not all-knowing and ask them for the things that you need. You don't want to go to someone who will be unsympathetic Someone who won't understand what you're asking for. Someone who when you ask Him for bread will give you a stone. No, you want to go to the God who Jesus says in Matthew 6 verse 8 is your Father who knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask Him. And you want to go to the God who's not always everywhere, not only always everywhere to hear you, who not only knows your need, but who can supply your need. In Matthew 5 verse, or actually in many verses, in Matthew 5, Jesus Christ gives to us an extensive lesson on prayer and what the Lord provides for us. And He says in Matthew 5 verse 30, here's the summary of it all, Wherefore, if God so clothe the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall He not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? And so Jesus teaches us the power of God to supply us with what we need and with what we ask. And let's take His teaching for what it means. Jesus, Jesus wants us to know God not only feeds certain birds, but all the birds. And that He clothes not only certain flowers, but all the flowers. And God wants us to see that and understand that so that we will understand He is able to feed and to clothe and to see to all the needs of His beloved, precious people. So, we go to God in prayer. We must note that that is a matter of keeping the first commandment in the law of God. We worship God in prayer. When the Buddhist, the Hindu, the Muslim, when they pray to other gods that are idols that are not God, they are breaking the first commandment. The Roman Catholic, when the Pope teaches the Roman Catholic to pray to Mary, or to pray to any of the other saints, the Pope is teaching them to sin. When Jesus taught us to pray, He showed us. That's disobedience to God. And, and this is another point that needs to be made, that's unnecessary. You don't have to pray to anyone else. You have a Father in Heaven, you pray to Him, and He's the only one you need to approach in prayer. Pray and speak to God. That's prayer. But now there's two other things that we need to note about what prayer is. Second prayer is a humble expression of need the catechism teaches us. Do you understand what a miracle, what a precious gift prayer is? The catechism wants us to think about that this morning. The Catechism wants us to think about how unbelievable this is that we may have a conversation with God, that we may have covenant communion with God, that God would share us with us His secrets and say to us, and I want you to come talk to me. He is. He is Jehovah, the eternal God, almighty, majestic, righteous, holy, infinite. 
in His greatness, in His being, and in His works. Therefore, therefore it's amazing that we may talk to God. Not as equals, no. That point can be made here again. We need to know our need. We need to be humble. The Catechism says that we rightly know our need in misery that so we may deeply humble ourselves in the presence of His divine majesty is necessary for prayer. We have needs. And right away maybe we think, and the Catechism mentions that, the things we need, we think about those things. And we teach our children we need things for our body, we need things for our soul, we need to pray for them. And, and when we hear our children pray, sometimes it becomes a bit repetitive. Yet, we must not judge those prayers. Those are beautiful prayers. Where our children are asking God for food and drink and clothing, shelter. They're asking God to bless the church. They pray for the preachers and the teachers. You hear them pray for those things. And that's important. We need to go to God and ask Him for the things we need. But this morning, let's understand that prayer is not a matter of the right words. Merely. Although that's important. In fact, let's recognize this morning that it's possible to go to God with all the right words. Ask for all the right things. Use the appropriately reverent language and still not really pray. Because it really comes down to the heart. Let's remember that. Sometimes when we're hearing other people pray, our pride comes in and we're quick to judge based on what we hear, the words and so on. But let's remember that we need to be careful not to judge the heart that prayer. That's the important thing. Maybe we teach our children it's important to close your eyes and fold your hands. But maybe there are times that you don't fold your hands and you don't close your eyes. Maybe it's when as a mother in the home you're overwhelmed with all of the children in your calling. And from the heart, you lift a prayer to God. Or maybe it's as a workman and you're overwhelmed in the workplace with your responsibilities and your calling and you offer from your heart a prayer to God. This is what is important. Scripture teaches us to go with a sense of our neediness before God, humility before God, so that we're sincerely pouring out our hearts saying, Lord, this isn't merely a custom or a habit that I have every day, but I'm coming to You as the fountain, the giver of all things, knowing that I need from Thy hand what I ask. David, in Psalm 50, verse 15, understood this when he said, This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him. This is the prayer we make in Psalm 100 or Psalter number 187 stanza 2 when we say needy and sorrowful O Lord to thee O Lord I cry this is the prayer that the Lord hears the humble heartfelt prayer conscious of need but then Prayer is to God from a heart of humility in the second place. But prayer is also the expression of childlike, confident trust. We're unworthy. And there are many reasons for us to think. Many reasons that we could come up with why God should not hear our prayers as we look at our lives and see all of our sins, as we look at our prayers and see how 
imperfect they are. Why would God ever hear us? Over and over again, we turn from God. God doesn't move, though. And that's what we need to see this morning. God doesn't say to us when we sin, you better run and hide. God says to us, come to me in repentance and faith. I will receive you and your prayer. And there are two reasons, especially why we are confident. The first is, for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. The catechism mentions this. Here is something that we ought to teach our children. Every prayer ought to mention the Lord Jesus Christ. Every prayer ought to be made in the consciousness of the forgiveness of sins through Him and that it's only for His sake that we may and do pray. And we pray, pardon mine iniquity, for it is very great with David in Psalm 25, verse 11. Confident that God will do that for Jesus' sake. And in the second place, we are confident because of what God has promised in His Word that He will hear us. Listen to God. Listen to what He says this morning about prayer and believe this. Jesus Christ said in John 14, verses 13 through 14, Whatsoever ye shall ask in My name, that will I do. And then in John 16, verse 23, Whatsoever ye shall ask the Father in My name, He will give it you. Scripture teaches us everywhere, God hears the prayers of His saints. Psalm 66, verse 19, the psalmist says, But God hath heard me, He hath attended to the voice of my prayer. Think about that this morning. The prayers of Abraham, the prayers of Moses, of David, of Jesus Christ, the apostles, all those prayers that Scripture assures us, God heard and He answered. And hear God say to you this morning, I'll hear you. I'll receive you as my child and answer your prayers. That's prayer. A conversation with God that starts with God in which we in humility and in confidence go to Him knowing He will give us what we need. But while we may ask the question, why is prayer necessary? Do you ask that question this morning? Or maybe at other times, do you wonder that in your own experience as you pour out your heart to God in prayer, do you ever ask yourself, why is this necessary? I know for one thing, God knows my needs. Jesus tells us that. He knows my needs even before I ask. And I know for another thing, If God loves me, He will never let me to have a need go unfulfilled. He will supply my needs. Why must I go to Him in prayer? Now the catechism answers that question for us this morning. But before we look at the answer of the catechism, let's notice what the answer is not. And this is important. This is something we understand, but it's important that we remember this and teach our children this too. We don't need prayer in order to inform God of what we need, for one thing. But we also don't need prayer so that we can change the mind of God, bend the will of God. There are some who have that conception of prayer. There are some who think God won't do some good thing in your life unless you ask Him. So if there's a fatal illness... God won't give healing 
unless you ask Him. And if you do ask Him, even though God might have been thinking first that He wouldn't give healing, if you do ask Him, you might be able to change God's mind so that He will give the healing. And then that conception of prayer means that when there's a need, you better call all of your friends send out an email, maybe post something on Facebook so that hopefully if people will storm the gates of heaven, then God will change His mind and do that good thing that you want. Well, the Catechism does not teach us that we can change God's mind in prayer, nor do the Scriptures teach us that. For in the first place, the Scriptures teach us that our Lord God is immutable. He is the unchanging God. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, God declares, I am Jehovah. I change not. Prayer cannot change the mind of God. In the second place, that contradicts the sovereignty of God. That really changes the nature of prayer. Do you understand that? If we were able to go to prayer, to change the mind of God, to bend His will to our will, then we would become sovereign. And then, who would want to go to God in prayer? You understand, that would be like a father saying, I have more wisdom and ability and knowledge than you, my son. But this is what I'm going to do. I am going to put you in charge. You determine what you need and what's good for you. And we would all recognize right away, wouldn't we? That's a weak father. That's a foolish father. That's an unfaithful father that's not worthy of any trust. We pray to a father who is sovereign, who knows what we need, who is so sovereign that He has determined not only that we must ask, but that we will ask. He gives us the grace so that we ask for the very thing He wants us to ask. And in that way, He gives us what we need. You understand, we know that prayer does not change the mind of God because God is a God who has an eternal plan. A plan that does not change. A plan in which He governs all things so that they happen. Even our prayers. And His answer to our prayers according to that plan. So then why is prayer necessary? Why does God require that we ask what we need? The answer to that is in the first place because of the relationship that we have with Him. Or that He, that He has established with us a relationship of friendship. God speaks to us. He speaks to us. How strange. How strange would that be if we did not speak to Him? Can you imagine a marriage like that? The husband speaks to his wife, tells her that he loves her, that he desires her companionship and friendship. He overflows with words of love and compliments. And from her there is stone silence. That's not a relationship. And that's not the relationship God wants with you and me. God looks at us and sees us as His friends. Oh, that's sometimes very hard to understand, isn't it? Why doesn't He look at me as a sinner? Why does He not look at me as someone who has no right to approach to Him? And of course, the answer to that is Jesus Christ and His cross. God laid all my sins upon Him and now for His sake forgives me all my sins and says to me, I do want to hear from you, my friend. That's what God said when Abraham prayed. Ah, it's my friend Abraham. 
My friend David. And that's what he says when you and I pray too. No, no, the relationship is not one of equals. It's not. But you see, that too is why God wants us to come. He doesn't want us to live in this life as if we think we can take care of ourselves. We can depend upon other people. He doesn't want us to go to other gods. He wants us to come and ask Him. And if we take the attitude that we won't go to God in prayer, God will say, you don't think that you're my child? You don't view yourself as depending upon me? You don't love me? You don't want my friendship? Then I'm not going to give you in that way my grace and Holy Spirit. You come to me, loving me, desiring my friendship. Then then I will give all that you ask. The second main reason why we must pray is because it is the chief part of thankfulness. We have been delivered from all our sins by Jesus Christ. Now we need to show our gratitude by our actions, by keeping the law of God. But then the catechism says, this is the chief part. In prayer, you may be very specific. In prayer, you may consciously enjoy fellowship with God. In prayer, you can pour out your heart in an even better, more direct way. In thanksgiving to God. And so, with the psalmist in Psalm 92, we say it is good to thank the Lord in prayer. Now there's one more question for us this morning. We know it's necessary to pray, to pray as God's friends, to show Him gratitude for our salvation. Now the question is, how should we pray? The disciples asked Jesus that question. He, they asked Him that question for our sakes. They asked Jesus, Lord, teach us to pray. Lord, how should we pray? And then the Lord Jesus Christ gave them the Lord's Prayer. That's what we call it, the Lord's Prayer. But we may note this morning that this is not a prayer that would be appropriate for Jesus to pray. But this is the prayer He gives to you and me to pray. It's a model for us. And this morning, we are not going to look at the content in detail, but only look at the general features of this prayer. Noticing in the first place that this is a proper prayer. It is a prayer that is addressed to God. It is a prayer that expresses humility, dependence, and neediness. And a prayer that expresses confidence in God. It's very reverent. There's no foolish phrase or word in this prayer. No casual attitude to God in this prayer. And it is, we should note, very simple and brief. I'm thankful that when the disciples asked Jesus to pray, He did not give to them a long-winded and very learned and scholarly model. That means that you do not need to be a priest to know high Latin to pray to God. You don't need to be a rabbi or a Pharisee who is able with flowery words form phrases to pray to God. You don't need to be a theologian, a seminary trained minister. No. Jesus gives to us a prayer that is so simple the children can understand and with their hearts bring these words to God. Charles Spurgeon 
was right when he said, Prayer is the lisping of the believing infant, the shout of the fighting believer, the requiem of the dying saint falling asleep in Jesus. It is the breath, the watchword, the comfort, the strength, the honor of a Christian. If thou be a child of God, thou wilt seek thy Father's face and live in thy Father's love. The little boy, the little girl, the man, the woman of God is taught by Jesus how to pray. You don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be embarrassed by your inadequate and imperfect prayers. Come with the knowledge of your neediness, humility, and childlike faith. Ask God for His grace and Holy Spirit with a sincere heart, and He will answer the sincere prayer of faith. Amen. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank Thee for this gift of prayer through our Lord Jesus Christ. More precious it is to us than any diamond or pearl. More precious even than the air that we breathe. What a wonder that we are able to hear Thee speak to us and then to bring our praise and our requests unto Thee. Going through Jesus Christ into the throne room of Thy grace in heaven. O oh Lord, Thou hast taught us again this, this morning the importance of prayer. Now continue to teach us to pray and to teach our little ones too that we may receive each day not only our earthly needs but Thy grace and Thy Holy Spirit. For Jesus' sake, Amen.